Okay, everybody. Now we're going to be talking about memory, something that I'm sure all of you will find uh, very uh, important and very helpful for your success in this course, as well as all of your other courses. And I think you'll learn a lot of interesting things about how our memory works. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things about memory that um, maybe we don't con we don't understand, or that we uh, that we or rather we we misunderstand. And so we're going to be talking about uh, some various things about how memory works and how memory uh, you know can can be can fool you in some way. Okay, basically, you know, basic textbook definition of memory is the retention of information or experience over time. So it means information might be something that you learn in a lecture from this course, let's say, it's information, some facts and concepts. Uh, but also memory involves your experience. You might, you know, your, your experience of, uh, no, of riding a bicycle is something you've experienced and you actually have a memory of. It may not be something you can, you can, you know, describe to someone how to do it. It's more or less just something you can do, but it's nevertheless a memory. It's a memory of your experience. Uh, so you can mem you can have a memory of you know, where you were at a particular time and what you were doing and stuff like that. Uh, so it can be both, you know, again, in both information and experience. Um, the information processing model of memory looks at memory in a very similar way into, in the way memory works when it comes to working a computer, uh, both with a computer and with a person. Uh, we're talking about uh, memory involving three processes, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Basically, encoding is the processing of information into the memory system. This is where you're taking all, taking the information in. So anything that you are experiencing, anything that you're reading, you are processing this information and putting it into the system, into a system that you're using for the memory to work. After the information is encoded, it goes through a process called storage. And this is where the material that you are learning is now stored over time. We have a way of keeping this information in our memory system over an extended period of time. Just like, again, you can think about there are many things that you've learned throughout your life that you have stored in your memory, somehow stored in your memory. Okay. But the storage is, uh, you know, so once it's there, that's good, but you also need to be able to retrieve information from storage. If you can't retrieve it, then that you really can't do anything with it. So retrieval is getting this information that you have stored out of memory. Okay? Well, again, this, you think about how this would work with a computer as well. With encoding, you are typing information into a keyboard to, uh, you know, typing, if you're writing a paper, for example, in, on your computer, you're using the keyboard to encode the information. You are processing this information into your system. Okay? So you've typed all your sentences and your paragraphs into your computer. That would be the, the encoding process. But now you need to store it on your computer. Well, now you hit save. So you save the information on your computer. And it is saved on your computer's hard drive. It is stored there. So if you turn off the computer and then come back and turn on the computer the next day, the information is still stored there. And you can just be able to, now you would be in a position where you have to retrieve it. And that's the retrieval process. So with a computer, you would have to say, okay, where on the hard drive is it? It's, you know, okay, you find the directory that it is located in. You open the directory, you open the file, and you can go ahead and start working with that material, you know, adding a new paragraph to the paper. So the encoding, storage, and retrieval kind of works with the computer, also works with uh, human beings. So let's uh, talk about encoding. And encoding, you have to realize that in order for us to be able to uh, 
you know, use this memory, use anything that we've learned later on, and use it in an effective way. We need to encode it properly, okay? And some things, you know, we, uh, we work very hard to encode it in a uh, deep way. Other times, you know, maybe we just hear the words and don't really process it that deeply. And in those cases, you are going to, your encoding is going to be kind of weak. Interestingly enough, we encode information all the time, and we often do it automatically. A lot of the stuff that we encode is done without any kind of conscious effort. We just kind of automatically take it in. Okay, so we are, when we are observing the world around us, we are encoding a lot of the information around us. And this information is coming in, and we're not necessarily trying to remember certain details about the, uh, the environment, but we automatically encode a whole lot of information. Um, you know, so again, there, there, are, there are many examples of stuff that we just, you know, we don't pay attention to, but, you know, we, we don't think where we are, you know, consciously paying attention to, but we are processing this. As an example, if you think about, you know, uh, an exam you've taken, and maybe you had a, a, a phenomenon called the tip of the tongue phenomenon, maybe where you remember reading about something, but you don't quite remember everything about it, and you're having difficulty answering the question. Well, it's possible that you did not encode that information very deeply when you first read it. But have you ever had the circumstance where you remember where on the page you read this material? That it was on the top right part of the page, or on the bottom left part of the page, and you remember where you read it, but you don't exactly remember everything of what you read. That could be pretty frustrating. But what that indicates is that you automatically encoded the location of the information, which is really not that important for an exam, but nevertheless you didn't properly encode the, um, the information that was in there. So again, sometimes we encode stuff automatically that may not seem very important. On the other hand, there are certain kinds of things that we want to remember. Hence, the material that you're studying for the next exam is material that you'd want to encode strongly using attention and using effort because you want to be able to do well on the next exam. So you have to put all of your attention, sustain and undivided attention towards what it is you are trying to, uh, what you're trying to encode properly. Realize that if you are, you know, if you're you know, maybe uh, trying to do several things at once, you know, what we call multitasking, is that you're actually going to be weak on all of those other tasks that you're doing. And it's going to be, if you're trying to remember several different things, the encoding is going to be relatively weak. And therefore, when you try to re retrieve it later on, you're going to have some difficulty. So it's important to be able to focus your attention on them. And by the way, if you don't attend to something, if you don't pay attention to something, well then you are going to miss it. You're not going to you're not going to encode it and you're not going to remember it. So you want to be able to you can use some effort into in encoding. One of the way, you know, elaboration is the is the technique that we're that we want to use to uh, strengthen those uh, that information, that encoding. Okay, you want to make connections, make mental connections. You know, you can connect different concepts. For example, you learn one concept in my psychology class. It might connect to something you learned in an anthropology class. When you form that connection, it actually strengthens your memory. It strength. It makes it a strong encoding process, making it uh, more likely you'll be able to retrieve it later on. Vivid examples are things that really make us, um, you know, hit home with the hit, hit, hit home with the with the with a particular memory. So anytime you know, maybe an instructor might give a really interesting example of a particular concept.
that makes you laugh or makes you cry, then clearly that vivid example makes it more likely you're going to remember that particular uh, concept. Finally, self-referencing effect is something you should always be thinking about is how does this material relate to you? How does it connect with you and your life? And I think that's something that you could be doing in all of your classes. Make personal connections with what it is you're learning and you can get an idea of how it relates to you. You can think about examples in your own life. For example, when we talk about it, about when we get to the chapter on learning, I'll, I'll tell you that there are many examples of how we learn, you know, that in our real lives that connect to the concept that we're going to be talking about in that in, in the class. So make a connection between what you learn and what you're trying to learn and trying to remember and something that's personal, that is a good way of strengthening the encoding process, strengthening your memory. So when you're encoding, shallow levels of processing are, you know, maybe thinking about the shapes of things without any meaning attached to it. Uh, if you're trying to, you know, just get a basic recognition of a concept, that's a, that's a little bit more deeper processing. And finally, like deep processing is really uh, understanding the meaning of things uh, and making associations with what you already know, thinking about memories that you've had. All of that really strengthens it. So, so the deeper you process, when the deeper the process when you go through encoding, the more likely you're going to remember it later on. So again, here is, an, here is a you know, summary of how elabor elaboration is going to enhance your memory. Um, if you hear uh, in a lecture the instructor define a particular concept, maybe the cue is that lecture, that particular definition, right? Well, it's going to be hard to make that connection. You forget the definition, you're going to forget what it is you're trying to remember. But if you have, so if you don't find that cue, if you don't have that that trigger that's going to get it, you know, you, you have nothing else to work from. But what if you had many different triggers all leading to the same target? So you had, maybe you heard something from the lecture, but you also saw something on TV, and you also heard something that your grandmother said, and you heard something that your sister told you or you, you something you read about in a book all relating to the same concept, well, you're going to get a really good uh, likelihood of remembering that concept because even if you forget one cue, you'll you might remember three others. And as a result, you will be able to access that information much more easily. So, any kind of strategies that people use for memory all uh, are using elaboration. And by the way, there are, there are memory experts who use many different interesting strategies for uh, strengthening their memory. And one of the ways is to come up with many, many different connections to, a, to target information, allowing them to uh, get from a number of different ways so that they're going to be less likely to forget. As we were saying before, visual image, vivid imagery, referencing yourself, these are things that you can do to strengthen the encoding, strengthen your memory. So let's talk a little bit about imagery and, and perhaps why imagery is so helpful in terms of uh, cementing your memory. Uh, one hypothesis, the dual code hypothesis, argues that in any piece of information that you're trying to learn and remember, there's a verbal aspect to it. In other words, what is the name or the word that's defining what it is you're trying to remember? And there's also an image code to it, which describes what the uh, what the the thing that you're trying to remember looks like. It's you know, forming a visual image of it. Okay. 
uh, and you store both these verbal codes and the images for image codes. So you store the, the label for what it is you're trying to remember. You also store the image of what it is you're trying to remember. Well, here's the thing. Images serve as both. In other words, they serve as both. A, there's a verbal component and an image component. Because again, the, 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 the image is connected to, uh, to the, the, the verbal. The image involves, you know, it, it, it is both the image you see and the label of it. So in other words, the image is both. The verbal is just verbal. So that is why essentially when you're remembering, trying to remember an image, the image is also attached to the meaning behind it. So if you remember the image, you also remember the meaning. And that's the dual code hypothesis.